Uh, we're going to talk about pseudonossifs, uh, and in particular, uh, how they relate to type mode geometry. Um, so let me uh, just start, finally, uh, with the definition I was going to make a few days ago. Um, so pseudonossif homeomorphisms. Okay, uh, so <laughs> what is that? So let's take f from s to s. Uh, this is an orientation preserving homeomorphism. Uh, and we say that this is pseudo anosov So this is pseudo anosov So I'll just write PA uh, pseudo anosov uh, if the following happens. So if uh, first there exists some number, lambda. Um, depending on f, um, bigger than 1. We should have some Riemann surface structure. So remember, that means we'll put on our Riemann surface clothes. Um, we also uh, have a quadratic differential, such that, well, in the local coordinates of this, the preferred coordinates for this quadratic differential, uh, the homeomorphism looks like um, just stretching horizontally and contracting vertically, so um, by lambda, such that in preferred local coordinates, of phi, uh, f looks like uh, x plus i y goes to lambda x plus uh, i one over lambda y. Okay. So, okay, so that's what a pseudo of homeomorphism is. Uh, let's maybe, um, let me try to make, just say more precisely what, what I mean. It looks like that in local coordinates, the preferred local coordinates. So remember, we've got our surface S. Um, we've got our Riemann surface structure. And then we have the homeomorphism F, and we look at... Uh, uh, we can conjugate this map. We do H inverse FH, and this becomes a map on our Riemann surface. And then remember the, the quadratic differential uh, gives us these preferred coordinates. So we have some U alpha here and some U beta here. And well, this, so uh, we pick a coordinate. So for any coordinate chart around a, a point here, we look at the image and we restrict, we find some coordinate chart here so we can think about this as a map between our coordinate charts. Uh, and then, so uh, these map to C, and what we're saying is that in this map from C to C, it looks like x plus i, y goes to uh, lambda x plus 1 over, plus i times 1 over lambda y. So that's what we mean, it looks like that in local coordinates, the preferred local coordinates for our quadratic differential, okay? So if you, um, if you remember from Carlos's talks, he was talking about affine, uh, affine homeomorphisms of, of this translation structure. So um, uh, the quadratic differential, if, if, the, if it actually comes from the square of a, of a holomorphic one form, then um, this is exactly uh, an, an example of an affine uh, homeomorphism of that uh, translation structure, but I mean, the fact that it's not a square isn't really important. It's still affine in the local coordinates, okay? And <laughs> let me uh, also uh, make a, a, another observation here, which is, well, what happens if I change these local coordinates to other local coordinates using um, GT? So let me change from this Riemann surface structure to another one um, where we use xt, right? So remember, we get xt and a quadratic differential phi t by changing these coordinates by gt. So we could do that here and here, but it's not too hard to see. I mean, gt commutes with this, right? gt is e to the t x plus uh, i e to the minus t y. So in fact, in these local coordinates, it also looks like 
uh, lambda x plus i 1 over lambda y. OK? So what is it saying? It says that uh, in the definition of being pseudo nosov well, um, it wasn't so important that I, uh, that I used this particular quadratic differential. I could take any of the quadratic differentials that correspond to points along the Teichmuller geodesic defined by this quadratic differential. Okay? So it could also use, so um, remember this was what I was uh, denoting. So GT phi was the map from x to x t phi. Um, and I composed with my original marking. It was just the identity on, on x, but the different coordinates. OK, so we could also use this. And remember, the quadratic differential here was called phi t. Sorry. Yeah. So lambda depends only on f. And in the preferred coordinates, so we choose preferred coordinates. We're not taking arbitrary coordinates for our Riemann surface. These are preferred coordinates for the quadratic differential. And remember, any two preferred coordinates differ by a translation and possibly a rotation through 180 degrees. So if I choose any two coordinates, it's going to look like this up to possibly translating and then uh, um, multiplica uh, multipl multiplicating. Yeah. Uh, multiplying by negative 1. It's also multiplicating. Good. All right. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, this map, it looks like, like GT, right, where T is uh, uh, log lambda. Um, and it's not too hard to see, actually. So, uh, if instead of doing um, FH, so if I do FH, uh, so... Uh, in my local coordinates, right, that looks like x plus iy goes to lambda x plus 1 over uh, lambda iy. I could also change my Riemann surface structure by doing uh, gt, uh, where t is uh, log lambda. And so what that really says is that if I think about the action of, well, I have to do this for the inverse of f because of the way we act, but what it's saying is that the pseudo and also of f is acting by translation on Teichmuller space with an axis given by this geodesic. So um, basically, from this picture, what you get is that uh, if f from s to s is pseudo and also, then the mapping class of f acting on Teichmuller space acts by translation along a geodesic, so a Teichmuller geodesic axis, which we'll call uh, ax of f. And not only that, but how, what's my translation length? It's exactly log lambda. OK? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going uh, to clarify that in a minute. Right now, all I'm saying is that there is a geodesic that's preserved by F, and well, the geodesic is isometric to the real line, and I'm acting by translation on that copy of the real line, um, translating exactly by that. So uh, as Barack is suggesting, uh, yes, that's right. That geodesic is the Teichmuller geodesic defined by phi. That's right. OK? So we can define the translation length um, of any mapping class. So let's define uh, the translation length. So let's take a mapping class. Uh, let's define the translation length of this mapping class. So it's acting on Teichmuller space. Remember, we saw last time uh, it's acting by symmetries. So, um, we can ask for the translation length, which will be the infimum over all points in Teichmuller space of the distance in Teichmuller space between that point and its image. 
So how far is f moving that point? How far does f move a point? And, um, uh, and then try to infamize that over all of Teichmuller space. Okay? Now, for a pseudo and ossive, I'll leave this as an exercise. For a pseudo and ossive, we've got this axis, and we're translating along that axis exactly by log lambda f. If I take any other point, okay, and I say, how far does this other point move? Well, uh, the exercise is that that other point has to move no more, sorry, no less than, than log lambda f. Okay? Um, so this is, so I'll give you a hint to do the exercise. I drew part of the picture here. I want to think about iterating. Okay? So if I move some point distance less than that, then I could apply the triangle inequality, go k times, divide by k, and I would be moving this point to this point by k times some number less than this, okay? A definite factor. On the other hand, I can use the triangle inequality to go between here and here, just going up here, k times over here and, and over here, okay? Yeah? Uh, it does suggest it, but uh, it is wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, there isn't a hyperbolic structure on Teichmuller space. This is a theorem of, uh, um, well, okay, so there are various, so first of all, the, the Teichmuller metric is, is not negatively curved in any sense. Um, so the strongest notion might be something like cat minus one or something, um, if you know what that means. Uh, it's not cat minus one. In fact, it's not even hyperbolic in the sense of Gromov that like um, Javier mentioned. Uh, and that's due to uh, Mazur and Wolf. Um, so, but what it does suggest is, um, Sorry, which metric is not even the Teichmuller metric. In fact, there's no, stop, stop, stop. Um, so what it does suggest is a relationship with isometries of hyperbolic space. Okay. So, um, and, I, and in fact, the one way of thinking about the Thurston-Nielsen classification is exactly um, trying to follow that analogy. So let me, um, so, so this is called the translation length of f. And <coughs> um, let me make another definition related to this. We'll say that um, tau is realized if the infimum is actually a minimum. So <laughs> if you think about, um, even for isometries of the hyperbolic plane, we talked about, right, there's this classification of isometries of the hyperbolic plane into um, elliptic, hyperbolic, and parabolic. And we saw that parabolic transformations, they move points smaller and smaller distances, right? There's, uh, so this infimum, the, the sort of analogous thing for the hyperbolic plane and a parabolic transformation, the translation length is zero, but no point is actually moved a distance zero. There are no fixed points in the hyperbolic plane for a parabolic transformation. So that's an example of a translation length that is, um, so in that case it's zero, but it's not realized. Is it clear what I mean? Okay. So the proposition says that for pseudo and ossives, the translation length is positive in fact, it's equal to log lambda f, and it's realized. Okay? Yes, so, so I'm... You, they're the unique ones that are positive and realized. Okay, any questions on that? So let's... Um, let me state uh, the classification theorem in a way that uh, has a little bit information than the, 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 the standard. I mean, it's the same thing, but um, okay, so given uh, given uh, an element of the mapping class group. Oh, and let me say, so this is really um, Thurston's work. Nielsen is often, um, his name is usually attributed to this because he did a lot of work on studying elements of the mapping class group and, and sort of got very close to this classification from a very different perspective. Um, and in fact, after Thurston's classification, uh, um, I think it was Handel and Thurston maybe actually carried out Nielsen's 
um, program to its completion and, and, and gave another proof of the classification. So if that particular uh, approach, if, if you're interested, is in the book of Kasten and Blyler. Um, there's also an article by Handel and Thurston. I think it's Handel and Thurston. Okay. Anyway, um, and then uh, another proof was given by Bears, and that's really the proof that I want to, I'm not even explain the proof really, I'm just going to sort of maybe hint, hint at it. But this statement is, uh, is essentially the way that Bears described the, uh, the classification. And it's, um, it is uh, one that's related to Teichmuller geometry, and that's why I want to mention it. Okay, so, um, so given, uh, given an element to the mapping class group, there exists a representative, so remember it's a, um, this is a homotopy class of homeomorphisms, so let's pick uh, a representative, um, F0, from S to S. Yeah? Geometry of Teichmuller space with the Teichmuller metric. Yeah, that's, that's the way the proof, as you'll see in a second. Um, so there exists a representative, F0, of of f, it's such a noisy board, such that, okay, let's start with the pseudo and also case, one, so maybe there's a representative which is pseudo and also, so, um, so uh, one, if this translation length is bigger than zero and realized, uh, then, um, F naught is pseudo and also. Uh, and the translation length, um, just to drive on this point, the translation length is log lambda. So let me just point out from this um, that uh, this translation length depends only on the homotopy class. And in particular, this number lambda uh, depends only on the homotopy class even though it's really described in terms of a particular representative. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, later, I'll explain another reason why this is independent of the representative. Uh, yeah, what? No, it's log lambda f. So the, the quasi-conformal map is lambda squared quasi-conformal. And then type moment, right, because you're doing lambda 1 over lambda. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's one case. So you should think about this as the analog of a hyperbolic isometry of the hyperbolic plane. Right? You have an axis, you have positive translation length, and you're translating. So, um, yeah, another reason for writing the, the statement this way is because it, it, uh, it makes a nice comparison with this, the classification of isometries of the hyperbolic plane we described in the first day. Okay, second, if the translation length of f is zero and realized, then f uh, is, has finite order. Maybe as I go along, since I'm not really going to say anything about the proof, let me just sort of uh, indicate. Um, so the proof of this is sort of uh, using um, essentially this description here um, together with uniqueness of, of geodesics between any pair of points in the Teichmuller space. So Teichmuller geodesics are unique. I mentioned that last time. Between any points. So using that and this description, you can sort of unravel um, uh, the definition of pseudo and also, and, um, uh, and you, can, you can prove this statement. Uh, this, you can also just unravel the definition of what it means for two, point, two uh, Riemann surface structures to be equivalent. Right? That definition, um, if you apply it to, to this, uh, what you'll see is that you can find some Riemann surface structure on which uh, and, a, and a representative where, where that representative is actually conformal or holomorphic, which means it's an isometry with respect to the hyperbolic metric, and then the group of isometries of a hyperbolic surface is finite. So this has to be a finite order element. Okay. So, um, so that's sort of the idea between for one and two. And then three, let me put them both together and then I'll say a little bit, um, so th there's, no, there's no content here, it's always bigger than or equal to zero, um, but not realized. Then there exists uh, a multi-curve, so that's a, a one-manifold, C inside of S, such that F naught of C is C. 
So this is the reducible case that, that Javier mentioned. And being reducible uh, uh, can be um, being reducible can be uh, recognized uh, in terms of uh, uh, the action on Teichmuller space also. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Any question on the statement? Yeah, I really mean infinite order reducible, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, let's go ahead and say that. F, the order is infinite. Um, let me refine this just a little bit. So actually, this breaks into two cases where the translation length is 0 and not realized, and when it's positive and not realized. So when it's 0 and not realized, then in fact, this representative can be taken to be a root of a multi-twist. Okay? If it's positive and not realized, then you have a pseudo loss of component. Okay? So this relates to, to um, what, what Javier uh, uh, had talked about in the last previous two talks. OK. Any questions on the statement? Yeah. That's right. So a multi-curve uh, is, if you like, it's an embedded uh, one submanifold or uh, a disjoint union of uh, essential simple closed curves. So essential, and that uh, means homotopically non-trivial. We're in the closed case, so that's all we need to say. OK, so that's, that's sort of Bayer's statement. Uh, let me just indicate in, um, um, in, in one minute um, what you do in this last case. So hopefully you have some idea of why this should, should be true. Um, let me indicate why this, should, uh, why this is true. Um, so, uh, um, the, the first thing you want to you try to show is that if I, have, uh, if I have some sequence of points in Teichmuller space where I'm trying to realize this infimum, okay, so a sequence of points where the, the distance that those points are moved limits to the infimum, to the actual translation length. So the first thing you want to show is that in that case, there must be some curves on your surface, on your, uh, on, your, on your surface S, so that in the Riemann surface structures for those points in Teichmuller space, those curves are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Okay, so the hyperbolic length is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So that's the first step. The second step is that um, it's, a, uh, it's called the, the Collar Lemma. The Collar Lemma says that if I have, a, uh, if I have an extremely short curve, so extremely short curve on a hyperbolic surface, then it has a very big collar. Okay? In fact, uh, if the length of my curve looks like, um, let's say, uh, 1 over n, then the collar has width log n, roughly. Okay? So why is that important? Because if I have a really short curve, any other curve that crosses it, that intersects it, has to be very long. Okay? OK, so then the last step is really Wolpert's lemma. So remember, Wolpert's lemma says that if I move some distance in Teichmuller space, the length of a curve can only increase by a function that's exponential in the distance. OK, so it's just a function of the distance. So what's the point here? I take this sequence of points in Teichmuller space where I'm trying to realize the minimal translation length. I've got curves on those, on those hyperbolic surfaces that are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And I'm moving by this element f some bounded distance. Wolpert's lemma says that that curve can't get much longer. Okay? And if the curve is extremely short, I can iterate the map a bunch of times, and the curve is not going to get much longer under you know, as, as many iterations as I want. On the other hand, if I've got a collection of disjoint curves on a surface, and none of them are isotopic to each other, okay, then there's at most 3g minus 3 such curves. Which means that if the curve is short enough and I apply the map enough times, I have to come back to where I started. That curve, together with its images, gives me the curve C. OK? Does that make sense? OK, so that's the idea of uh, the proof. OK, so that's the classification theorem. Um, what I want to do next is uh, I want to talk about um, somehow the, the most interesting case 
um, the pseudo and also case. Uh, and I now want to spend the rest of the time, 35 minutes, uh, talking, about, um, talking about that. And in particular, this number lambda. 45 and 40, yeah. Uh, well, I was already, oh, sorry, 30 seconds. Yeah. OK. Um, all right, so this number lambda is sometimes called the stretch factor or the dilatation Um, so that's this number lambda, lambda of f, uh, which we know is also now lambda of the homotopy class. Just depends on the mapping class. And um, so I mentioned that uh, you can see from this that the, this number depends only on the homotopy class. Here's another interesting way to see that um, that gives you some idea of what this is measuring. Uh, so f from s to s, pseudo and also, pseudo and also, um, m, any Ramanian metric. So if you like, think about it as a hyperbolic metric. Any Ramanian metric on s. Then the length of, let's map uh, n times on any curve. So uh, let's say alpha. Uh, any uh, essential closed curve. So I take a curve, and I'm going to just apply the map over and over and over. Uh, and then let's straighten it to a geodesic. So remember, this means you take that homotopy class, and you, you pull it tight to a geodesic. And then let's take the nth root of that. So this converges to lambda uh, um, for every essential curve. Okay. So I take the curve, I start applying the map, it's, you know, it's going to other curves, uh, and then ultimately the, the length is growing asymptotically um, uh, um, by, the, by an exponential function um, with base lambda. Okay? So eventually it's being stretched by lambda. So, um, so why is this true? Well, if you think about... Let me, uh, let me just, uh, again, I'll, I'll leave this as an exercise. So proof exercise. And what's the idea? So first of all, there's one metric where we can analyze this, this kind of thing very easily, namely the Euclidean cone metric that comes from the quadratic differential. Right? In that metric, I'm exactly um, expanding horizontally by lambda and contracting vertically by 1 over lambda. If I take a curve on, on my flat surface, the surface with this Euclidean cone metric. I pull it tight to a geodesic. What does it look like? It looks like, typically, a concatenation of segments that go between cone points, so Euclidean segments between cone points. And what happens when I iterate, you know, my map x, y, x plus i, y goes to lambda x plus uh, i, 1 over lambda y. Well, the segments are going to be stretched. Eventually, they're looking more and more horizontal. And the more horizontal they are, the more I'm stretching um, by something approximately lambda. Okay? So for the metric that comes from the quadratic differential, this is, fairly, uh, this is fairly obvious. Now, it does require you to know that when you take a geodesic representative and then you hit it, um, it's still a geodesic representative. And so the words here are uh, locally cat zero. Okay? So that, that flat metric is locally cat zero. OK, so it's true there. And then if you take any metric, well, if I have any other metric, uh, on my surface, lengths of curves uh, in the metric from the quadratic differential and lengths of curves on this arbitrary metric differ by a multiplicative factor of k. Okay? You should just think that the metrics are by Lipschitz to each other. That multiplicative factor of k, when I take the nth root here, just disappears. Okay? So, um, okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the statement, uh, the, the sort of sketch of the proof. Um, you can uh, work out the details on your own. Um, but it, it indicates that this number lambda, it's definitely not, it, def it definitely only depends on the homotopy class, right? Because if I apply a homotopy, um, when I straighten to geodesics, right, that homotopy is absorbed already in the homotopy of straightening to the geodesic. Okay. Um, and the fact that this is for any metric means that it, uh, you know, I'm not worried about the quadratic differential at all. 
Okay, is it, is it clear? Does it make sense why that's true? Uh, okay. Um, so, what other properties um, of this number do we know? Uh, in fact, we know a lot. Uh, and let me, let me try to now, um, uh, it's going to be a, a more sketchy, but, but let me try to explain one way of studying these pseudo-nosive homeomorphisms. Um, and it's really, this is really part of, of Thurston's proof of this classification theorem. Um, uh, but you can um, at least maybe believe that something like this should be true. So Thurston, uh, so f from s to s, pseudo and ossif, then there exists, it's called a Markov partition. for f. Um, and I'll explain what this means um, in a second. So let me just write the statement and then we'll talk about what it means. Oh, um, par Markov partition for f, so that's a collection of rectangles r1 through uh, rn, such that the associated um, transition matrix is Perron Frobenius. Oh, being, I don't know how to spell, uh, um, with Perron Frobenius eigenvalue lambda. So the associated transition, let, let me say associated, it's a non negative integral matrix, okay, and it has this eigenvalue lambda of f. So in particular, as a consequence of this, lambda is an eigenvalue for the characteristic polynomial of this, which is a monic integral polynomial. So as a corollary, one corollary is that lambda of f is an algebraic integer. OK, yeah. Two questions. Can we divide by the length of alpha? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. So the, the length of alpha star also sort of gets absorbed by, you could, you could inside divide by the length of alpha star, but because you're taking nth roots, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm confused. So every curve gets stretched? Yes. Every curve gets stretched. That's right. Eventually. 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 So you might take a short curve and then iterate backwards uh, you know, for a million years. And then you say, OK, now let's start applying the pseudo nosov to that curve. So for a million years, nothing's happening. But eventually, it does get stretched. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, really think about this, the, this, the pseudo nosov picture where your geodesic is sort of really going like this and going And from that, you should also convince yourself, right, this, that, that's fine as long as that geodesic isn't made up out of uh, segments that are vertical, OK? So you should think about why can't there be any vertical segments? I'll leave that as an exercise, too. Yeah? That's right. That's right. So it's really a statement about what's happening asymptotically. Yes. OK, so let me explain this uh, with some pictures, OK? So oh, I should be using the wet one. Huh? <laughs> Not good ones. OK. Um, so what's a Markov partition? So, so R1 through Rn, these are rectangles. So um, R1 through Rn, these are rectangles um, for the, the phi metric. So remember, we have this quadratic differential that's associated to the pseudo and ossif. Um, and it's got this Euclidean metric. And there's this preferred vertical and horizontal, right? So uh, here's maybe a local picture of uh, the vertical foliation. And there are singularities around. Let's just stay away from the singularities for now. And these rectangles are, um, they're locally isometric to Euclidean rectangles. Okay, so maybe here's, here's R1, and maybe there's another one. Uh, maybe there's another one over here. Here's R2. Okay, and then, I don't know, maybe there's another one over here. Here's R3. 
So R1 through Rn, they're rectangles, so the sides are made up of segments of vertical and horizontal segments. There are no singularities inside. And um, the interiors of these rectangles are disjoint, and the union is, uh, is the whole surface. Okay? So those are the rectangles that I'm talking about. So the Markov partition is a collection of rectangles that the pseudo and also um, uh, does nice things to. So what does that mean? So here's maybe one of my rectangles, call it RJ. I apply the map F. Now we know what happens when we apply this pseudo and also, right? It's, it's stretched by lambda horizontally and contracted by one over lambda vertically. The area should be the same. Okay. Now the, the condition that I require in these rectangles, I mean, this is what's going to happen to any rectangle like this. The condition that I want, um, one of the conditions, is that the horizontal sides are sent inside of horizontal sides. So I'm drawing now the, maybe the other rectangles um, that this thing crosses. OK, so this bit inside of here, this is f of rj. And then it's crossing some other rectangles, ri1, ri2, blah, 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 ri, uh, n, uh, k. And then let's ask, um, so, so uh, there's a similar property when I apply the inverse. The top sides should go into subsegments of top sides of rectangles. I'll write that. But when you have this picture, so that's, that's our Markov partition. Actually, I think this is called a pre-Markov partition, whatever. Um, what is this associated uh, transition matrix? Well, this RJ is being stretched over multiple other rectangles, right? So let's count, let's let AIJ be the number of rectangles F of RJ visits. Okay, so maybe, oh sorry, the uh, uh, number, of, number of times the rectangle FRJ visits RI. It's, the, it, uh, it's for the inverse. When you apply the inverse, the, so here is the statement about the, the, the vertical sides. When I apply the inverse, the horizontal sides should have a similar property. So when I apply the inverse, things will stretch this way, and I want the, the image of this top segment to go inside of uh, a segment of some rectangle, the top of uh, some rectangle, and the bottom should go to the bottom of some rectangle. Okay, okay so I want to know how many times does the rectangle RJ, when I apply F, cross over the uh, rectangle ri. OK? So that's this adjacency matrix. It's obviously a non-negative integral matrix. And I claim that there is um, a natural eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. OK? So what is it? Um, let's let wj be the width of the jth rectangle of rj. Right, we've got this Euclidean metric. Let's take its width. Um, uh, let's take the width of that uh, of that rectangle. And then, now let's see what this says. If I, so when I apply the map F, the width gets multiplied by lambda. So this is the width of the image of R J. On the other hand, the the width of R J, it's the sum of the widths of all the rectangles that it crosses. So that's the sum of the widths of the rectangles that I'm crossing, the wi's, times the number of times I cross that rectangle. Yeah? Uh, the lambda is uh, smaller than one or greater than one? Greater than one. Yeah. OK, so this just says that this width vector is an eigenvector for the matrix A. OK, and it's positive because the widths of the rectangles are positive. All right. And in fact, every rectangle um, it's not too much more work to show. Every rectangle actually has to eventually map over every other rectangle under iteration. So that's why it's a prone Frobenius matrix. Okay. And this is its prone Frobenius eigenvector, or, or a prone Frobenius eigenvector, these widths. And lambda is the eigenvalue. OK, any questions on that? Yeah? 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I'm trying to, so, so in fact, as I iterate more and more, or if the stretch factor is really big, right, this rectangle is extremely long and skinny. My surface is some fixed geometry surface, so it has to wind all around. And that's why you should think about, you know, these rectangles eventually map over everything, every, over all the rectangles. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, uh, any other questions on this? No, they don't have to be fixed, but they have to be permuted. Up to a power, they're fixed, yeah. Up to a power, they're fixed. The singular points have to be fixed, right? The local structure of the pseudo nosov requires them to be fixed. Uh, up to powers. They have to be permuted at most. But that doesn't mean that those... We need those... Uh, anyway, hmm. later. Yeah. Can you use this go up, con uh, construct uh, for Asia? Yeah, so um, uh, Thurston's original proof finds a single foliation that's invariant and then produces the other one by building a Markov partition, finding essentially this Euclidean structure on the rectangles and then making the other foliation uh, vertical or horizontal, whichever one you didn't have. Okay. Um, all right, so, uh, okay, so that gives you some idea of what kind of a number this is. Um, let me also mention uh, another way to see that this is an algebraic integer is if you were to, so if the foliations, so if this were from a holomorphic one form rather than a quadratic differential, um, then in fact, uh, the foliation, vertical and horizontal, these are these, um, uh, these are eigenvectors for the action on cohomology. So this is essentially, Carlos was, uh, had mentioned this. Um, and so lambda is an eigenvalue for the action on homology. If it's not true exactly on, uh, if the foliation comes from a quadratic differential, you take a square root so that things become abelian differentials or holomorphic one forms, and then you can see it there. Um, okay, so let me, uh, so, <clears throat> There's a little more that you can say about these, these Markov partitions. So the number of rectangles is actually can be taken to be linear in G. So that means that the stretch factor on a surface of genus G is an eigenvalue for an integral prone Frobenius matrix whose size depends on G, is linear in G. Okay? Uh, and from that, Penner deduced um, a lower bound on how complicated a pseudo nosov can be uh, on a genus G surface. So Penner says for all G, at least two, uh, pseudo also F from SG to SG. Log lambda of this pseudo and also uh, is at most, uh, sorry, is at least uh, log two over 12 G minus 12. Bless you. So why is something like this true? I mean, he said it in terms of train tracks, which are related to Markov partitions. But once you have, uh, once you have a non-negative integral matrix, um, you can try to estimate the prone Frobenius eigenvalue. And the estimates that you get depend on the size of the matrix. And if you just carry out that calculation, which is what he did, um, uh, you can see that uh, the, the log of that eigenvalue is bounded below, uh, essentially by one over the size of your matrix. Okay, so, but he also said there exists pseudo onosives on a genus G surface, such that log lambda FG is at most basically one over G, so log 11 over G. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I said the words sort of how complicated. This number lambda is supposed to tell you how complicated a pseudo is, all right? Um, it's measuring, um, I mean, if you think about uh, the theorem I erased, how, you know, how fast, the, what is the exponential growth rate for lengths of curves under iteration, right? If they're not growing very fast, then the, the pseudo is in some sense not too complicated. 
Okay. So these pseudo-nosovs where, so if I look at the least complicated pseudo-nosov on a surface of genus G, log of its stretch factor is on the order of 1 over G. Okay. So I explain why it, you can't do any less complicated pseudo-nosovs than that. It's just this Perron Frobenius stuff. So I want to, in the last, um, yeah, uh, somebody calculate, 14 minutes, let's, um, I want to explain a little bit about uh, this upper bound, and because uh, this has been, a lot of people have thought a lot about uh, um, these kinds of pseudo nosses. So, um, right. Uh, four. All right. Um, oh, let me. Um, so this this bound is not optimal. So um, there are better upper bounds. Um, so uh, Echo Hironaka, um, and then uh, Kin and Takasawa, and um, Aber and Dunfield. They all produced examples, sequences that show that this. So uh, let me uh, let me make another definition. Let me do it here. So. <laughs> uh, I can look at all the pseudo loss of homeomorphisms on a surface of genus G. I'm looking at the least complicated ones. So let's give that number, that least complicated number, a name. Let's call it LG. This is the minimum of log lambda F, where F from SG to SG is a pseudo one also. So I'm going to look at that least dilatation or that least stretch factor log of that okay so I mentioned so if you uh, uh, if you remember the the classification and in particular bears picture the mapping classes that preserve geodesics are exactly the pseudo and authors and the length of the translation length is exactly log of lambda f okay so uh, Javi mentioned this, and I was going to sketch a proof, but uh, we ran short on time on a different day. The action of the mapping class group on Teichmuller space is properly discontinuous, and the quotient is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And the Teichmuller metric, because it's invariant, descends to a metric on moduli space. And so what this collection of numbers, so forget the min, this collection of numbers, it's exactly the lengths of geodesics in moduli space. And so we're asking for the minimal length geodesic in moduli space. So that's another way to think about uh, what this is and maybe why um, another reason why people are interested. OK, so, uh, so they showed that this is at most um, log of 1 plus uh, root 5 over 2 uh, over g minus 1, I think. Is that, or is it 2 in the numerator? 2. Um, Yeah. So you can do better than log 11. Um, OK, so what I want to do is uh, explain a little bit about um, uh, you know, where do these small dilatation or these low stretch factor, low complexity pseudo nosovs come from. Um, in particular, these constructions all appeal to what I'm going to describe. This is not what Penner did, but I'll say maybe a word about that at the end. Um, uh, but before I do, maybe let me just um, mention a few open questions so I don't run out of time at the end. So Penner, um, I think this is probably due to Penner. Um, you just asked, what is LG? Right. I mean, it's a number. What is it? Uh, it's known for G equal 2. So this is due to um, Cho and Ham using a result of Ham and Song. Uh, so it's, so it's computed for g equals 2. Uh, and that's it uh, as stated. Okay? It's not known for g equals 3, g equals 4. However, there are lots of results where uh, related values have been calculated. So for, for braids, so the classical braids, you can think of those as mapping classes on a disk, punctured disk. And they're... Um, Co-long and so uh, co-long uh, co-lo 
post. Oh my God, I wrote it down. Uh, uh, co loss and song. Um, so they they calculated what it is for uh, uh, for five strand braids, or four strand braids. Uh, Ham and Song did it for five. Uh, Lano and Tifo did it for up to eight, eight strand braids. Eight. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so there's some other special cases where it's known. Also, you could require not arbitrary pseudonosives, but pseudonosives that have some extra symmetry. Uh, so you could ask for pseudonosives or, or, or have some extra features that you can take advantage of. So Lano and Tifo looked at what happens if you require that rather than a quadratic differential, the pseudonosive is associated to the square of an abelian differential, so homomorphic one form. And in that case, the foliations are this, these foliations are uh, orientable, okay? Uh, and so they calculated the associated number um, uh, for various values. Uh, so some uh, up through nine, eight. Eleven. Oh, seven. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, you could also look for, so we've been talking about the mapping class group, which is orientation preserving homeomorphisms. You could also take orientation reversing things and Leisty and Strenner, uh, they calculated up through uh, eight. Yes, yes. So if you, if you allow orientation reversing things, again, these are extra conditions that you can take advantage of, okay? Uh, so they calculated the minimum of, of orientation reversing pseudonosives up through genus eight. Yeah? Okay, something like that. Okay, good. So I don't feel bad that I can't remember the exact result. <laughs> um, and then uh, you could also ask for, uh, like, you know, there's an associated quadratic differential, so you could ask about the singularity structure. Um, and uh, uh, Boisi and, and, uh, and Leno, so they gave the first explicit values for infinite families. Um, so they were looking at the particular components, so particular strata, so pseudonosives, um, uh, you know, we mentioned these geodesics, closed geodesics in moduli space, if they live in a particular stratum, you can ask, you know, does that impose any additional constraints? Uh, and so um, Boissy and Leno uh, actually computed the minimum um, over a, a particular infinite family of strata. Okay. So the point is that, in general, it's really hard. It's really hard to calculate the minima, okay? Um, yeah? It's related to the minimal number of Yeah, so uh, let me, let me uh, it's not directly related. There are related things, uh, but maybe we'll talk about that afterward, um, just so we can try to finish in time. So let me, um, let me just pose another question due to McMullen, also open still. So uh, this minimum uh, is going to zero like 1 over g. And so you can ask, if I multiply by g, does this converge? You know it's bounded above and below by positive constants. Uh, and so the question, does it even converge? I don't know. Uh, OK, so uh, in the last five minutes, let me try to explain, um, let me try to explain uh, why there are upper bounds on the order of 1 over g. Why can you find pseudonosives uh, on genus g surfaces so that log of the stretch factor looks like 1 over g? Okay. So for this, we need to appeal to some uh, other machinery. Well, I mean, in fact, you can do this more elementary, but I, this is a really beautiful theorem, so I want to mention. Um, long page. So let me start with a pseudonosive. And so let's let f from s to s be pseudonosive. Uh, on a genus G surface, again closed, there's, uh, okay. Um, let's let M be the mapping torus of F. So this is, I take uh, the surface across the interval and I glue the top to the bottom using the map F. So here's a picture. So there's the surface across the interval and now I glue the top to the bottom using homeomorphism F. Okay, now there's a flow on this, 
so there's a flow, let's call it psi. So <clears throat> in this product structure, it's just x comma, uh, so let's say psi sub s, x comma t goes to x comma s plus t. Okay, so that defines a, a local flow, generates a vector field, vector field c. So this is local flow. Uh, so we get this flow. And if I start here at the bottom, the surface S cross 0, and I flow up at time 1, well, this is glued to this. So at time 1, the surface is sent back to itself. And it's sent back to itself exactly by F. So the first return map to S is exactly the map F. OK? So um, what's the theorem here? Uh, this is due to Thurston and Freed. And it says so M and uh, M and F just like over there. So um, then there exists, so those assumptions, then there exists one, uh, an open cone in the second homology of M. OK, we just went to somewhere else. So the second homology of M means second homology of M with real coefficients. This is a vector space. OK, looks like this. There's a cone. That means an R plus invariant set. It's open. And for all alpha in that cone, and let me say the integral point in the cone. So it'll be an integral homology class um, intersected with the cone. There exists a surface, S alpha, which is transverse to this flow. So in fact, it's a cross section. And the first return map, F alpha from S alpha to S alpha, is pseudo and also. OK, so there's some. For every, oh, I should say, um, the homology class of S, S is a, S is a surface inside of a three-manifold, it's an oriented surface. It represents a two-dimensional homology class. This cone contains that homology class. And there's a property that, so here's that homology class. Take any an integral point, then this is also represented by a surface transverse to this flow. So the surface doesn't look like this one. It's not horizontal. It's sort of tilted in some way. But it's still transverse to the flow. And the first return map sends the surface to itself. And it's pseudo awesome. Second property is that there exists a function, I'm going to call it chi bar, from this cone to R, which is linear. And chi bar of alpha is just the Euler characteristic of S alpha if alpha is one of these integral points in the cone. So this function, this function is a linear function. It's calculating the Euler characteristic. Okay, So for every integral point, there's a surface transverse to the flow. There's a function that calculates the Euler characteristic. And three, there exists a function, call it h, from the cone to r, which is convex homogeneous of degree degree uh, minus 1. That means if I scale by t, the value of the function is multiplied by 1 over t. Homogeneous degree minus 1, such that for alpha in this cone, log lambda f alpha. So the associate, it's a pseudo noss of f alpha. right? Every, every point in here gives me a pseudo noss of. And the log of the stretch is the value of this function. And that's h of alpha. OK? So can I take two more minutes yeah. to, to just say the punchline now? Um, I can't reach. To OK, so what's the punchline? So here's the picture again. Here's s. Let me take a sequence of points, alpha n, that are projecting, uh, that are Converging projectively. So let's let alpha n be a sequence of integral points uh, so that tn, 
this, let's say, distinct, distinct integral points, so that Tn alpha n is converging to the homology class of S. So in particular, the Tn's are going to 0. Let me also assume that they're primitive. So that just means it's not a multiple of some other integral class. So out of this, I get an associated collection of pseudo losses. Okay, so I have f alpha n from s alpha n to s alpha n. And now let me note that this function, uh, h alpha times chi bar alpha, this is calculating, let's do alpha n, this is calculating uh, the log lambda f alpha n. This is calculating the Euler characteristic. Let me take the absolute value. So that's the Euler characteristic of that surface. On the other hand, this, the, so this is linear. Chi bar is linear. So if I multiply by t, the value is multiplied by t. This is homogeneous of degree minus 1. If I multiply by t, the value is multiplied by 1 over t. So if I multiply by alpha, if I multiply this by tn, this is multiplied by 1 over tn, this by tn. And so the total uh, change is nothing. So this is h tn alpha n. This is chi bar tn uh, alpha n. But tn alpha n is converging to s. s. So this is converging to h of the class of s, which is log lambda of my original pseudo -nosif times the Euler characteristic of my original surface. This is a number, some fixed number. So these numbers are converging to this number, which means in particular they're bounded. So this is basically the genus of that surface times log of the stretch factor is bounded. OK? All right. So um, that's a construction. And it just so happens that essentially all pseudo that are that have this property that log lambda times g is bounded actually come from this construction. This is the only way to build examples. All right, I'll stop.